this is this is such a wonderful day um, for for reasons I didn't even anticipate when we first talked about this, um, because this is the same day that I got the the um, confirmation that we will be announcing uh, a new series. Um, it'd be the first series that I have done since Touched by an Angel. And I just find God's timing so perfect, you know, that um, it's so easy to find your identity in something that you did. And I am, will always be grateful to be and have been the executive producer of Touched by an Angel. But more than that, I think it was that my identity and all of ours who worked on the show for so long cannot be attached to a thing but to attach to the fact that God gave us the gifts to use them on a show like Touched. And in his good timing, we have that opportunity to use those things again. Um, when he says, okay, now you're going to do this, or let's, here's a door that's opening, will you walk through it? And um, I, I think the most amazing thing about Touched is how it came about and how God's faithfulness um, just sustained me, certainly, and so many of us in this room for nine years. And I, a lady came in and she said, this is my first Hollywood event. And I said, well, you know, you're not going to really recognize anybody here. <laughs> but what's so important is that, you know, in the beginning was the word. And so many of those words on that show were written by people who are in this room right now. And people that I, I began all of this with. And um, Bob Kaleri is here. It's so, it means the world to me that you came. Um, Bob is um, my oldest writing friend. Uh, we started together on the Facts of Life, and he's ne a day never goes by that um, I, I don't think of something or say something the way Bob would say it. You know, we saw Abby Singer walk in today, and I went, excellent, which is just what Bob would say. Um, Abby, by the way, this little girl was named after you. She's sitting right in front of you. Abby Singer, if you don't know, is one of the most famous gentlemen. He's, you would have seen his name at the end of so many shows, Mary Tyler Moore. and um, He was uh, a man who who represented absolute excellence uh, in the industry, still does. He, you're still working at AFI, if I believe, and he's remarkable. Um, and he was one of those gentlemen who really inspired me that said, whatever we want to do, we want to do it well, we want to do it excellently, we want to do it with dignity and class and good humor. And I think for the most part we did, um, considering it was my first experience as an executive producer, the, you know, the class went up and down a little bit sometimes <laughs> as I was learning, learning the ropes. But, but the standard was always there, and it was a standard to which we aspired. Um, I wanted to share with you the very first thing. I had, there's this little piece of paper has a sign on it, it says the Genesis document. And um, I had been working for CBS doing um, sort of fixing pilots, and they would send me off, and I'd do a rewrite on a pilot that wasn't quite working and needed to be shot. And um, I was, I guess, good at sort of walking into difficult situations and figuring out what needed to be done and sort of dispensing with the politics of it. And so they called me up and asked me to do a show called Under One Roof with James Earl Jones in Seattle. And I was so excited because um, Thomas Carter, who was shooting it, had read my work. And when I showed up, he thought I was uh, black. He thought I was an African-American. And um, because it was uh, the first African-American uh, family television show um, since the Cosby's, it was certainly going to be the first drama. And he was not sure at first that I could write it. And we spoke for a long time, and I said, what I can bring to you is I can ask the difficult questions, and in the process of answering those questions, we will go deeper into any script than what anybody normally would expect from a typical drama. And so working on that pilot, I had a tremendous experience being um, the only uh, white producer, writer, person involved in that, uh, in that pilot. And it made me realize that um, I have got to start putting myself in other people's place, and I couldn't just keep writing like a shiksa from Denver. <laughs> Little did I know that the day that uh, Under One Roof was supposed to be picked up, I got a call from CBS, and they said, we're not going to pick up Under One Roof. 
it was a Wednesday morning, and I was very, very, very upset. And I felt that it was um, a decision based upon racial considerations. Uh, they it was at, right after the uh, LA riots. They were making some political decisions regarding their programming. I was very angry with CBS. Three hours later, I got a call from my agent who said, we're sending something over to you right now from CBS. They want you to do this show called Angel's Attic. Take a look at it, and if you want it, it's yours. You can be the executive producer of this show. And I looked at it. It was a pilot. Roma Downey and Della Reese were in it as angels, and that's about all that it had to do with what you know about Touched by an Angel now. Um, but in the first about 10 minutes, um, there were drug jokes and they were smoking and they were making, they were saying bad words and, and I, I just said, I can't, I can't do this. My spirit, I, my spirit is offended. <laughs> and besides, I'm really mad at you for not picking up under one roof. So I'm going to cut off my nose and spite my face. And I called up CBS and said, I'm not doing this show. I'm a Christian. I would not want to be involved in a show like this. Well, um, they took one of the people there, took me out to lunch to say goodbye because they didn't have any other, anything else for me. And I had worked loyally and faithfully for CBS for a long time. But now they didn't have, if I wasn't going to do Touch then, or Angel's Attic, there wasn't anything left to do. And I found myself at that lunch saying, now when you do that show about the angels, just remember this. Just, re just keep thinking about that. When, when you, whoever you get, make sure they, you know, da, da, da. And slowly but surely, over the next two days, um, I realized maybe I should do that show. I just, I didn't know. And I had an offer, a solid offer to do another, uh, another series on ABC. And I called them up, I, and I, I prayed about it. I asked a friend of mine to pray with me, and he said, Martha, I truly believe that God is telling you that you need to go back and humbly um, say you would like to do that show. So I called up ABC and said, I'm not going to accept your offer. And I called up CBS and said, I would like to try the Angel Show. And they said, well, we've just called in somebody else. And uh, so now you're going to have to come back next week and interview for the job because he's going to interview on Tuesday. You can come back on Wednesday. And if we like you better than him, then you can have the job that you already had two days ago and gave up. And that, that was the longest week of my life because I realized I made a huge mistake. I had put myself into a situation instead of taking myself out of it and asking God to show me. It was um, the first of many, many mistakes I made on Touched by an Angel. But in each case, whatever mistake I did make always drove me back to my knees and took me to the foot of the cross. I know that that day on Wednesday, I was in my car, and in one moment, I felt that I was absolutely going to walk in and get it. And in the other moment, I thought, I'm just going to convince them all that they should hire the other guy, and they dodged a big bullet. But I had a, a, a yellow pad in the car. I was driving, taking the 110 to the 10, you know, to Robertson, and to however I was going to get to CBS. And I, whenever it, the, the traffic would slow down, I'd scribble another idea I had. And I still have that piece of paper. And what I, what I put at the very top was something I'll never forget. It says, understand the moral imperative, that there are rules to follow. And every television show has rules. Star Trek has the prime directive. They have the rules to go fo forward where no man has gone before to seek out new life and new civilizations. And every Breaking Bad has rules. There is a show Bible. And that day I realized that there is already a show Bible written for Touched by an Angel, and it's called the Bible. <laughs> and um, it was kind of scary. But I walked into that meeting with the, ev all the executives were there, and they had in their hand a $2 million 
pilot that was finished and broadcast ready. And it had angels that had wings like Venetian blinds. Um, and uh, Roma raised a dog from the dead. She couldn't help the autistic kid at all, but the dog came out well. Uh, and I just finally, and I walked in and I sat down and I said, they said, can you save this show? I said, no, I can't. And they said, well, what would you change? I said, absolutely everything. And they said, would you keep the, the, the two actresses? And I said, I need to meet them, but probably. But that'd be, the, that'd be it, the two actresses and the word angel. Everything else goes, I want to do a brand new pilot. And it was a very bold and scary move. And, and that if you didn't believe in God before that, I did afterwards. Because the president of CBS looked at me and said, everything you just said, go do. And that was my great commission. And I think what was, what was most powerful was that I had nothing to lose. I had gotten to that point, as I said, at the foot of the cross, where I realized that anything that I was um, going to gain had been bought for me already by Christ, and that if I didn't get this job, he knows my future. He has a plan for me, a plan to not to hurt me, but to give me a hope and a future. And whatever that was, I was going on that ride with Jesus. And um, who knew that it was going to be so long and do so well? Um, and, and the reason it did was because I, I was smart enough to call up my friends. Um, Marilyn Osborne was one of the first people I called. Bob Collier was the first person to see the pilot. That I, the second pilot that I did. Um, Ken, who worked with me on Jack's Place. Um, I had met Ken back a few years earlier. And there are good and kind people. And, I, and you, you'll get it when I say this. There were people on lists that they gave me that were just the hottest, hippest people in Hollywood. And I said, <laughs> I don't want the hottest, hippest people in Hollywood. I want Bob. You know? um, <laughs> <laughs> I can, you know. but what you do is you choose if you're going to go on a ride like that, you go on with your friends, and um, and I I have no regrets um, other than my own failure to be kinder sometimes or to keep my mouth shut when remembering what it's like to at ten minutes to eight have your child say, "Mommy, I need a Halloween costume," by nine and you know, and those are that makes you a better writer finally because you are really experiencing what's what's true and when you combine that with a greater truth then you can't beat it because the people out there in the world who we have run into all of you I'm sure you've said it Bob Dan Jennifer um, people come up and say when are you gonna have another show like Touched by an Angel when are you gonna do another show that I can watch with my children and um, I think we've got one now um, but I I know that that proves to me that that audience will never go away. And it proves to me that also that we have, we have in what we do not just the opportunity to touch people one hour a, night, a week on, with a television show, but to change lives within and without that experience. Um, within the experience, one of my greatest joys, Luke Skelhaas is sitting in the back, started out as a runner collating and now he is one of the producers of The Good Wife. And um, I take full and complete credit for that. <laughs> um, you know, RJ you know, and Marcy. And, but f I think also outside of all of this are the, the opportunities that you help people with the words that you say. Words are life. And the words that we have spoken or put into the mouths of those of Della and Roma, who arguably were some of the finest actors I have ever worked with, because it's not easy to say God loves you in uh, 213 different ways, and they did, and they and they they believed it, they they sold it because they believed it, and um, and I I truly truly will always be grateful to them for giving life to those words, but the words began as life, and we wanted to speak life onto the page and into the homes of uh, people in watching television. And those messages of life came back to us. As I was going through some of these papers, I found so many 
of the um, letters, the fan letters that people wrote to us. And the stories are stunning. You may have seen some of them there. A gentleman who had uh, planned to uh, take his own life and had made gone to such uh, a degree that he had all of his um, information and had signed a donor card and put it in plastic and he was putting it in the car and he was going to drive right up to the hospital and, and take his life and then his organs would be fresh for donation. And um, for reasons that I don't recall right now, he decided to watch his television show before he did this and it was touched. And he realized that uh, Again, God had a plan for his life, and this was not it, and that his organs would be just fine for somebody later. But right now, he needed to live. Um, I, I, one of my favorite stories is a lady who um, wrote to us after she saw our homeless episode and said, after we saw the episode of the, about the homeless, um, I turned to my husband, and I said, we, we have to go find my brother. And they went out and found her brother who'd been living on the street for many years, and they brought him back into their home. Um, those are only two, and we had thousands, and Marcy Gold can attest to this. We had thousands of letters that came. In fact, the show itself received more fan mail than the actors did because, because the message was the star of the show. And I think we all recognized that. And for, in some ways, that's probably why I was so committed to uh, making sure every script you know, fit a certain mold, because that message wasn't mine. That message, uh, to the best of our ability, um, we took from the Bible and from God. And that had to be uh, con consistent and constant and, and clear and true. And that was a hard thing to do. Uh, but it paid off in, in a thousand ways. Um, if you, ha I'm sure all of you have seen Touched by an Angel. I do happen, I did find this piece of paper that I enjoyed a great deal. Touched by an Angel, use this and you too can be on the writing staff. Cold open, angels watch stuff happen. End of the cold opening, everyone, everything looks fine to Monica, but Tess is concerned and we know that means trouble. Act one, Monica meets her assignment by posing as someone she's not. The assignment immediately starts to get grumpy with those around him. Act one break, bad stuff happens as Monica watches, concerned. <laughs> Act two, Monica tries to help her assignment. Tess tells her she has to try harder, or on even num numbered episodes, tells her the assignment has to do it themselves. <laughs> Act two break, Andrew, the angel of death, shows up, which leaves Monica concerned. <laughs> Act three, the assignment speeds down the wrong path, capital W, capital P, faster and faster as the road gets windier and windier. Act three break, Monica has failed. The assignment hits bottom as Tess watches, concerned. <laughs> Act four, first scene, two, pre-revelation scene, three, revelation scene, four, post-revelation scene, five, angel tag to be cut in post by RJ, the dove flies. End of show, everyone's life is better, including 12 million viewers. End on a beat about coffee loving. <laughs> um, it was obviously harder than that, but in, basically it was true because what we tried to do, whether we were dealing with human rights in China or um, uh, Down syndrome or uh, the um, slavery in the Sudan, uh, uh, war in, in Ireland. Uh, we had so many opportunities to really dig deep into some very, very difficult issues and still make them fam family friendly. But we basically followed this, this plan because it was something that, frankly, was a universal. There must be a way to put a face onto some of the bigger issues in, in, in the world and bring them home to us. And perhaps the the face that I will most remember is the one uh, with the slavery in the Sudan episode, where um, it was such a huge issue that I kept putting it off. And I had a good friend who kept encouraging me, Sonia Dunn Hodson, kept saying, "You have to write about the Sudan. You have to write about it." And I said, "I don't. I don't want to get. I don't want to get into that. I don't want to get into that." And I realized that I, I was just as concerned about that as I had originally been with Under One Roof. Do, do I really 
belong in this in this and what I had to do was then again start asking the difficult questions and by hitting the obstacles and that those were opportunities for answers to write about and in the process of finding the obstacles and trying to understand why Sudanese slaves would be sold for fifty dollars a piece um, I came to realize that we all have an opportunity to shine light on something that that we cannot bear or understand or process and if, if we could show that and put a face on it to the 23 million people who were watching Touched by an Angel, maybe one of those people would do something about it, and that would change a life, and that was enough. And all I had to do was dig deep and do my homework. And that is, I think, one of the greatest secrets to screenwriting, is do your homework. Um, read the Bible, say your prayers, trust God, and do your homework. And um, finally, we did that, and we chose one little boy, and his name was Sam, and he was one slave, one young man who had been put into slavery in the Sudan, and his picture made his way, made its way to Washington to the son of a United States senator who was caught in a very big political game of should I support or should I try to defeat um, a, a movement to stop slavery in, in the Sudan. And at that moment of great, great um, conflict, because she could lose everything. She would lose all of her financial support and all of her campaign money, and she would probably, as a result, lose the next election and no longer be a, a senator. But in that moment, Monica looked at her and she said, you know, who knows that you were brought to the kingdom for such a time as this? You know, you are the one. You are the one, you're the only person who can stand up for one moment and get on a plane and go to the Sudan and pay money for $50 for these people and film it and bring those pictures back and prove that it's happening to everyone else and show that this is the closest thing to hell on earth. You are the one to do that. And I'll, I'll let you in on a little secret. Sooner or later, everyone is the one. You just have to say yes when the time comes. And that show aired, um, Marcy Gold, my, my dear friend, um, executive vice president of Moonwater Productions, is um, who, who kept me on the straight and narrow. And when I forgot to read the Bible, she never did. And she read it to me you know, chapter and verse and reminded me and kept me on the straight and narrow every, every script and read every revelation scene. And Marcy was the one who uh, made it possible for us to show that episode in Washington, D.C., in a joint session of Congress, and that afternoon, the Sudan Peace Act was passed. And when you think about things like that, that's what television is for. And that's, that's what it's for. It is the highest and best use of television, and it was truly our privilege, all of us, um, to be working on a show like this. And, uh, and I thank you so much for recognizing that and for helping us make sense to it, and then to ultimately give us the opportunity to share that information and what we have learned um, with students um, here at Pepperdine. And um, it, this is not about just saying, oh good, I can get everything out of my garage and somebody else can deal with it. <laughs> this is about going through and finding those moments of, of absolute um, inspiration, and I mean when God puts into your spirit, inspiration, um, those moments that you recognize and say, that's when that human rights moment came. That's when that happened. God put me, I could not for the life of me figure out how to write that episode in China um, until my plane was canceled in Denver and I ended up sitting at a Chinese restaurant on the second level of Concourse B next to a Chinese man who I overheard was talking about human rights. And I talked to him for an hour and a half while I waited for another plane. And he was the one who gave me the key. And I know for a fact that God made that. There's just, there's just two, there are no coincidences. As a matter of fact, I will quote one thing from my, um, my beloved next show, Signed, Sealed, Delivered. It is, um, luck is the religion of the lazy. <laughs> and uh, it is hard work. It is hard work to be a person of faith. It's hard because you let yourself down a lot more than um, you, you lift yourself up. 
because we ultimately cannot lift ourselves up. That is God's work, and if we just trust him to do it, it will happen. And in the hardest of days, and I will just close with this, the hardest time I think we ever had attempting to lift people up was right after 9-11. Um, um, my darling husband, John Anderson, who I met um, perhaps the second day, I was introduced to him by Bob Gross, the over there, the, the man who I would consider to be the pillar of uh, CBS production, and Bob committed himself to making sure I did not fail. And together with him and John Anderson, who I, I met, worked with, and married because I couldn't live without him, um, we managed to keep the show going that day uh, on September 11. Um, we kept shooting. Uh, everybody else shut down, but we were determined to keep going because that's all we could do. Uh, we knew we were putting out a message that mattered. We knew we were that as long as those words of truth were being spoken and put into the into the world and into the universe that day, we were fighting with all that we had, and that was the talent God gave us. I think the greatest uh, honor I had, the greatest privilege that I can remember, is receiving a letter, um, a phone call, from um, Leslie Moonves. Um, and if you remember, what happened was um, all all regular programming ceased. There was no regular television programming um, for days. It was a Tuesday, and nobody was on, on the air with anything except news. And then I got a call from Leslie Moonves, and he said, Touched by an Angel will be the first show to come back on the air, on any channel, um, on any network. And I want you to write something um, for a PSA, something to introduce the show before we air it on Sunday night. Because I believe, and, and Leslie Moonves said this, I believe that people will be turning to Touch by an Angel for something more um, than they expect to find anywhere else on any other network this week. And this is what we wrote. For seven years, it has been the privilege of all of us at Touch by an Angel to offer messages of peace and assurance of God's love. At this difficult time in America, when hope itself can seem far away, we, we, we return to your home once again to share that God is near to us even now, ready to comfort us, to receive the souls of those we have lost, and to remind us that God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love, to carry on in his steadfast promise that we are not alone. It is with this faith that we bring you tonight's episode. And it is with this faith that I, I just challenge all of you with whatever talent God has given you to carry on. And thank you again so much for this honor. Thank you.